The sound of the propellers sent a rush down her spine, putting on her hat, gloves and goggles. She took some calming but deep breaths. The spirit of adventure was strong. She longed to explore and felt at home in the sky. This was what she was born to do. This was Amelia Earhart, and this is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. Amelia Earhart was born July 24, 1897, to Samuel Edwin and Amelia Amy Earhart. She was German descent, and her grandfather, Alfred Otis, was a well-off guy who was a former federal judge and president of the Atheson Savings Bank. He wasn't too happy or impressed with Amelia's parents' at marriage. Amelia was born a leader and was nicknamed Millie. Her mother had a more forward approach to parenting, not seeing the must for a nice pretty girl. Although Amelia would like this free childhood, she was aware how other girls were dre- wore dresses and she did not. Adventure ran through Amelia's blood, constantly exploring her neighborhood along with her little sister. They would spend hours climbing trees, hunting rats and sledding. They would also have odd pets like worms, moths, bush crickets, katydids and tree toads. Now in 1904, just seven, Amelia would attempt her first flight of sorts. With help from her uncle, they made a ramp and secured it to the tool shed roof. You can see where this is going and guess how it ends. Ending dramatically with Amelia getting some injuries of a bruised lip and ripped dress, but it fueled the interest in flying with her telling her sister in such excitement, it's just like flying. Amelia's father, Edwin, his career wasn't great. And in 1907, his claims office job for the Rock Island Railroad was transferred to Iowa. The following year, Amelia would see her first aircraft at a state fair. But the biplane didn't interest 10-year-old Amelia. It was too old, rusty, and made of wood, so it didn't impress her at all. So Amelia and her sister would live with her grandparents in Addison while her parents moved to Desmonas. During this time, the girls would be homeschooled in 19, until 1909. Then they would move with their parents and start a public school. The family's money situation improved and they got a new house with two servants. But Edwin, he had a drinking problem. In 1914, with the drinking issue, he was made to retire. He would try to fix the problem with a rehab treatment, but Rock Island Railroad never took him back. Around this time, Amelia's grandmother would die suddenly. She would leave a large estate to Amelia's mother, but would put it in a trust as she feared Edwin would drink it dry. Amelia would be heartbroken from this death. I would later say this is when her childhood ended. Edwin would spend the next year job hunting, eventually finding work in 1905 as a clerk at the Great Northern Railway in St. Paul, Minnesota. Edwin chanced his arm at a transfer to Springfield, Missouri in 1915. But the job he got, the person who left it changed his mind and demanded it back. So Edwin, leaving his job for this one, was now out of work again. Fearing more upset, Amelia's mother took the children to Chicago without Edwin. Amelia would look for the best science high school program to attend. The closest high school Amelia would ignore as it wasn't up to scratch. So she attended High Park High School, spending the semester alone and unhappy. Amelia graduated high school in 1916. From her troubled childhood, she took safety in a scrapbook she kept newspaper clippings of successful and inspirational women who excelled in male-dominated jobs. And this scrapbook would inspire Amelia to a future career. She began college, but soon she would drop out. Amelia would visit her sister Christmas 1917 in Toronto. World War I was in full swing and Amelia would see many injured soldiers returning. She would receive nurses aid training from the Red Cross and would work at the Voluntary Aid Detachment at Spadina Military Hospital. 
Her job was to prepare food and hand out meds in the hospital dispensary. By 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic hit Toronto. Emilia was doing her nurse's duties along with night shifts at the military hospital. In early November 1918, Emilia would be hospitalized with pneumonia and maxillary sinitis. She would be discharged late December 1918. While in hospital and with no antibiotics around, Emilia had a painful operation to wash out the affected sinus, but it wasn't successful and would have Emilia suffer with headaches from then on. She would recover at her sister's in Massachusetts. She would read poetry, learn to play the banjo, and study mechanics. The sinitis would affect her flying in later years. Even on the airfield, there would be times Amelia would be seen with a bandage on her cheek, covering a small draining tube. After her recovery, Amelia and a friend snuck out to watch a flying exhibition put on by World War I ACE at the Canadian National Exhibition, Toronto. The pilot would see the women watching from an isolated clearing. He thought it funny to dive at the women to scare them off. But Amelia stood still as the plane swished past. In 1919, Amelia went to Columbia University to study medical studies, but would quit after a year to be with her parents who got back together in California. December 28, 1920, Amelia and her father would visit Doherty Field. They would meet air racer Frank Hawks here. He would offer a ride and this moment would change Amelia's life forever. Speaking about it later, Amelia said once she hit 100 feet, she knew she had to fly. The flight would last 10 minutes and cost her father $10, but from then on she was determined to learn to fly. Working multiple jobs as a photographer, a truck driver and a stenographer, she saved up $1,000 for flying lessons. She would visit Kinnerfield South Gate on January 3, 1921 for her first lesson. Her teacher would be pioneer female aviator Anita Nita Snook and then would use surplus Curtis JN4 or Canuck to reach the airfield for training, Amelia had to take a bus to the end of the line and then walk five, four miles. Amelia's mother would also give money in support of her lessons. For Amelia to fly, she would need to do it all, take on the hard work and rudimental conditions that came with the training. She would buy a leather jacket, but not wanting to be seen as a newbie, she would sleep in it to make it look more worn. She also cut her hair short to be like other female aviators. Summer 1921, Amelia bought her own plane, a second-hand Canary Yellow Kinner Astra biplane called the Canary. October 22nd, 1922, Amelia flew this plane up to 14,000 feet, setting a new world record for female pilots. May 15th, 1923, Amelia became the 16th woman in the US to be issued a pilot's license. So in the 1920s, a disastrous investment in a gypsum mine failed. Amelia's grandmother's inheritance, which was given out by her mother, slowly vanished until it was all gone. So with no money and no way to pay, get money, Amelia sold her beloved canary and bought a Kissel Speedster she named Yellow Pearl. Amelia would have a bad sinus flare-up at this time, which landed her in hospital in 1924 for another surgery, which again failed. After this, Amelia tried to set up a photography company, but when it didn't work, she wanted a new direction. Her parents divorced in 1924. Amelia and her mother took Yellow Pearl on a transcontinental trip from California to Boston. In Boston, she had another operation for her sinusitis, which was a bit more successful than the others. Once recovered, she went to Columbia University again but again dropped out due to her mother being unable to pay the fees. Amelia found a job as a teacher and then a social worker in 1925. Amelia lived in Medford and kept her aviation interests. She became a member of the American Aeronautical Society in Boston and would be elected as its vice president. She flew out of Denison Airport in Quincy and helped finance its operation by investing some money into it. Amelia would fly her first official flight out of Denison in 1927. Amelia would fly 
again and would be a sales representative for Kinner Aircrafts and wrote in the newspaper columns promoting flying. As her popularity and local celebrity grew, she laid out the plans for an organisation devoted to female flyers. After Charles Lindbergh's solo flight across the Atlantic in 1927, Amy Guest wanted to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. But looking at it in more detail, she thought it too dangerous to take on herself. So she offered to sponsor the project instead, suggesting another girl with the right image to be chosen. April 1928, Emilia was at work and she got a call from Captain Hilton Rayleigh. Really. He offered her the place once she passed the interview. At the interview, she got the place, but was told she would be a passenger keeping a flight log. William Slutz would pilot and Lewis Gordon would be co-pilot. She would agree and left with the others for Newfoundland in a Fokker named Friendship on June 17, 1928. They would land in South Wales 20 hours and 40 minutes later. After landing, Amelia would report Slutz did it all, did all the flying, and she was just baggage like a sack of potatoes, but maybe someday she'll try it alone. Amelia received a great welcome when she arrived in Southampton, England, June 19, 1928. She flew the Avar Avian, owned by Lady Heat, and Amelia would later buy this plane, shipping it back to the US. The trio would return to the US to a parade along the Canyon of Heroes, followed by a reception with President Coolidge at the White House. Amelia would be remarkable as similar to Lindbergh in looks and in personality. Lindbergh would be the nicknamed Lucky Lindy by the press, so because of her likeness, Amelia was called Luck Lady Lindy. Immediately after returning, Amelia was sent on lecture tours from 1928 to 1929. Meanwhile, other companies for her, including a book deal, more lectures and product endorsements such as luggage, Lucky Strike cigarettes, women's clothes and sportswear. Now the Lucky Strike deal would soon be dropped because of image problems. The money made from it until the drop was $1,500. This was donated to the commander Richard Byrd's South Pole Expedition. The, those endorsements helped her fund her flying. She accepted a position as associate editor at Cosmopolitan magazine. She would use this as an opportunity to campaign for greater public acceptance of aviation, especially for women in the role. In 1929, she would be the first among the aviators to promote commercial flying as a travel means. She would represent Transcontinental Air Transport, or TAT, later becoming TWA. She was also Vice President of National Airways. Amelia gained fame from the transatlantic flight who wanted to set her own record. Once she returned, she piloted an Avian 7083 for a first solo flight, making the trip in August 1928. She became the first woman to fly solo across the North American continent and back. Her skills and professionalism grew with each flight. Amelia would enter an air race in, in 1929 flying in Santa Monica, California on August 18th and arriving in Cleveland and Hilo on August 26th. During the race, Amelia would be holding fourth place in the heavy planes division. At the second to last stop, a friend, Ruth Nichols, was third, but her aircraft hit a tractor at the start of the runway, flipping it over and forcing it and her out of the race. Because of this, at Cleveland, Amelia took third place. In 1930, Amelia became an official of the National Aeronautics Association, where she promoted to establish a separate women's record. On April 8, 1931, a new record of 18,415 feet altitude was reached by Amelia. At this time, she became involved with the 99s, an organization of female pilots providing moral support and advancing women in aviation. In 1934, women were banned to fly in the Bendix Trophy Race. Amelia was asked to fly actress Mary Pickford to open the race, which Amelia refused because of the woman's ban. During all this, Amelia would become engaged to Samuel Chapman, who was a chemical engineer from Boston, but this ended in November 1928. She would grow close with her publisher, George P. Putnam. He was known as G.P. 
and was divorced in 1929. He would propose to Amelia many times before she finally said yes. Jay married February 7, 1931, with Amelia calling the marriage a partnership. She would be a bit liberal when it came to marriage. She wouldn't hold GP to being faithful and would explain that at times she would need to her own space to avoid feeling like a caged animal. She believed in equal take and give and she kept her name. There was no honeymoon as Amelia was on a nine day cross country tour. They had no children, but GP came with two sons from a previous marriage. GP was married to chemical heiress Dorothy Binning. Her father had the company Binning and Smith, who just as a side note, invented Corolla crayons. Anyway, GP and Dorothy had two sons, David and George. Amelia got on extremely well with David, who would visit often in New York. George would sadly contract polio after his parents' divorce, so he wouldn't be able to visit as much as David. So the morning of May 20th, 1932, Amelia took off from Newfoundland with a copy of the Telegraph Journal to confirm the date of the flight. She wanted to fly to Paris in a single engined Lockheed Vega 5B, similar to Lindenberg's solo flight five years before. The flight would last 14 hours 56 minutes, but with strong winds, icy conditions and, med and mechanical problems, Amelia had to land at a pasture in Derry, Northern Ireland. This made her the first woman to fly solo non-stop across the Atlantic. She received the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Cross of Knight of the Legion of Honour and the Golden Medal of the National Geographic Society for this flight. Amelia would meet high profile people at these awards and became extremely good friends with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor shared Amelia's interests, especially women's causes. Eleanor would also go on to get a student permit to fly, but never learned. They would remain friends. April 19, 1935, Amelia flew solo from LA to Mexico City. She then attempted a non-stop flight from Mexico City to New York on May 8, which went great. She again took part in the long-distance Bendix Trophy in 1935, managing fifth place because her beloved Lockheed Vega would be outclassed by the purpose-built air racers reaching speeds double her top. The race was also plagued with blind fog, violent thunderstorms, arrival having to drop out due to mechanical problems and another dying in a fireball takeoff. 1930 to 1935, she set seven women's speeds and distance records in different aircrafts. By 1935, her beloved Vega would have reached its end. She was planning a new adventure and for it she needed a new aircraft. Late November 1934, a fire broke out at GP's house. Nobody was harmed, but everything was destroyed. After the fire, they moved to the West Coast. GP took a new job at Paramount Pictures, North Hollywood. Amelia took advantage of the Hollywood move and took up lessons from stunt pilot Paul Mance to help improve her flying, particularly long distance. Amelia convinced GP to buy a house in June 1935 near Toluca Lake. September 1935, Amelia and stunt pilot Mance would set up a business, Air Hot Mance Flying School, controlled and operated by Mance through United Air Service. GP would handle the publicity and the school taught instrument flying. 1935, Amelia would also join the Purdue University as a visiting faculty member and was a technical advisor to his Department of Aeronautics. Early 1936, Amelia would start to plan a round-the-world flight. People had flown around the world before Amelia, but Amelia was doing the longest at 29,000 miles, following the equatorial route. The university would give funding, and in July 1936, at Lockheed Aircraft Company, they would begin building a Lockheed Electra 108 to Amelia's design. Her design would have modifications to the fuelage, adding ma many, many more fuel tanks. Amelia would call it her flying lab. Amelia chose Captain Harry Manning as her navigator. He was captain of President Roosevelt's ship, 
which brought Amelia home from Europe in 1928. Manning wasn't just good at navigator, he was a good pilot, radio operator and also knew Morse code. The plan was a two persons crew, Amelia to fly and Manning to navigate. A trial flight cross country would have Amelia, Manning and GP. Using landmarks, Amelia and GP knew where they were. Manning's navigation concerned GP. His positioning would put them in the wrong state flying close to the state line. The error was minor but it still concerned GP. Later, GP and stunt pilot Mance would arrange a night flight with Manning. Conditions were poor and Manning's position would be off by 20 miles. Although within the acceptable error range of 30 miles, GP and Mance wanted a better navigator. Fred Noonan would be chosen as a second navigator. He was experienced in marine and flight navigation. The plan was to have Noonan navigate from Hawaii to Howland Island, the most difficult part of the flight. Manning would continue until Australia and then Amelia would proceed on her own for the final part. March 17, 1937, Amelia, Noonan, Manning and Mance flew the first leg from California to Hawaii. The plane would need servicing so it ended up at the US Navy's Luke Field on Ford Island in Pearl Harbor. Three days later, once the service was completed, Amelia, Noonan and Manning boarded the plane to set off once again. The next destination was Howland Island in the Pacific. The flight never took off, there was an uncontrolled ground loop. The forward landing gear collapsed and both propellers hit the ground. The plane skidded, damaging a portion of the runway. The ground loop claim was a bit controversial. Witnesses said a tyre blew. Amelia said she wasn't sure if a tyre blew or if a landing gear collapsed, while others, including Mance, said it was pilot error. Either way, the plane was badly damaged and the flight was called off. The plane was shipped by sea to Lockheed Burbank to be repaired. Now Manning had temporarily left his job to do the flight and he started to feel a lot of problems and delays were happening, too much in fact. So he ended his part in the trip leaving Amelia and Noonan, both of them weren't great at radio operating. So once repaired and securing extra funding, a second attempt happened. This time they were flying west to east. The first part, Oakland to Miami, was flown unpublicized. Once arriving in Miami, Amelia would publicly announce the plans. Going the opposite direction was somewhat because of the changes in global wind and weather patterns along the original route. So Amelia Noonan would depart Miami on June 1st, stopping at South America, Africa, Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, arriving at Le New Guinea, June 29, 1937. 22,000 miles were completed up to 29,000. The last 7,000 would be over the Pacific. July 2nd, 1937, at midnight GMT time, they took off from Leigh heading for Howland Island. A small 6,500 feet by 1,600 feet, only 10 feet high, and 2,556 miles from Leigh. When it left, the plane had 1,100 gallons of gas. Around three in the morning in Leigh, Amelia reported her altitude was 10,000 feet, but had to drop due to thick clouds. At 5, Amelia reported back altitude of 7,000 with speeds of 150 knots. The last confirmed report was near Nukunina Island, 800 miles into the flight. Before they left for Howland Island, the US Coast Guard sent the cutter USCGC to the island. The cutter is a ship that offers services like varying news reporters to the island and on it was communication and navigation tools. For Amelia, it would be a communication hub and would transmit a radio homing signal to make Howland easier to find for Amelia. 
but all navigation methods would fail to guide Amelia. So the cutter was at the station at Highland, and its purpose was to communicate and guide Amelia's Electra to the island once in the area. Errors and misunderstanding would happen. Using radio navigation wouldn't work. Noonan would report problems of affecting the accuracy of radio direction finding and navigation. There seemed to have been confusion about times. Amelia was using Greenwich Civil Time, which the cutter, while the cutter was using Naval Time Zone, making their communication off about half an hour. So Amelia's Electra was expecting the cutter to transmit a signal. Then the Electra could use the RDF beacon to find the cutter. But the Electra's RDF equipment failed because a fuse blew during the flight to Darwin. It was replaced. Near Howland, Amelia could hear the transmission from the cutter at 7,500 hertz. But unable to determine a direction to the cutter, the thought is Amelia's RDF equipment didn't work at 7,500 hertz. Most don't work above 2,000. And when made to go above the 2,000, the loop antenna loses their directionality. The cutter called it Itasca had its own RDF equipment, but it didn't work above 500 hertz. So it couldn't determine the direction of the Electra as it transmitted at 3,105 and 6,210 hertz. Now the Electra had been equipped it to transmit a 500 hertz signal that the Itisca could hear, but some of the equipment was removed. The antenna was bulky and heavy, so to save weight it was removed. According to some, Amelia wasn't fully up to speed with her direction finding system, which was fitted just before the flight. Amelia's training on the system was also brief. It's also been suggested that the antenna was under the fuelage and may have been knocked or torn off during taxi or takeoff from Lay's runway, although the antenna was never found. So Amelia and Noonan were approaching Howland Island. Itzeskag received strong, clear voice transmission from Amelia, identifying as KHAQQ. Now she could transmission out, but it appeared she couldn't hear transmission back from the ship. Signals from the ship were used for direction finding, which suggested the aircraft's direction finder wasn't working. July 2nd at 2.45 and 5 in the morning, routine weather reports were received stating cloudy and overcast. The calls were broken and static, but the plane was still a good bit away from Howland Island. At 6.14 a.m. a call came of them being 200 miles away and to start using the direction finder. Amelia started to whistle to provide a constant signal to home in on. It was at this point that the ship found out the RDF system could not tune in to the aircraft 3105 hertz frequency. At 6.45 a.m. Amelia called asking again for a bearing and they were 100 miles out. At 7.15 a.m. Amelia again radioed but said she couldn't hear the ship and for them to send voice signals to take a radio bearing. Issaska rem remarked this call was loud indicating Amelia and Noonan were close. But the Issaska couldn't send the voice messages so instead sent Morse code. Amelia confirmed she got them but was unable to encode it. The last transmission was at 8.43 a.m. Amelia said, we are in line 157337. We will repeat this message again. We will repeat at 6,210 kilocycles. Wait. Just minutes later, she would send, we are running on line north and south. This seems to suggest that Amelia Noonan thought they reached Howland's chartered position, but was off by 10 kilometers. Itiska would try smoke signals using its oil file boilers to generate smoke, but wasn't seen. The smoke signals were accused of maybe causing an issue, casting dark shadows on the ocean surface, making it look like islands 
or too cloudy that they couldn't see the flat islands. After all contact was lost, attempts were desperately made to reach them by voice and Morse code. An hour after Amelia's last message, the Edista started to search north and west of Howland Island, but didn't find anything. The US Navy would soon join the search. Four days after, on July 6th, the battleship Colorado received orders to take over naval and coast guard units. A week later, a naval aircraft would fly over the islands. The search would last until July 19th. The air and sea search by the Navy would cost $4 million, but the techniques were basic. Based on assumption and false info, and no physical evidence was ever found. GP would finance a private search when the official search ended. Late July, GP chartered two small boats, but no trace was found. Back in the US, GP wanted to become the trustee of Amelia's estate to fund the search. He'd request an LA court to waive the seven year wait period declaring a missing person dead, so he could manage the estate sooner. It was approved and on January 5th, 1939, Amelia was declared legally dead. It's still a mystery today as to what happened. Most believe a crash and sink theory, but there's many conspiracy theories. The crash and sink is straightforward. They ran out of fuel, ditched the sea and sadly drowned. Some say that the Dillis survived, landed on an island and just were never found. Some think they were captured and killed by the Japanese. Amelia's relatives believed the Japanese theory and that the Japanese dismantled the plane and dumped it all in the sea. There is an out there theory that Amelia actually survived, came home but changed her name and lived in hiding. Nothing has ever been proven and they have never been able to find them dead or alive. Hundreds of articles and books have been written about Amelia, which is often motivational and inspirational tale, especially to girls. She's regarded as a female icon. Her accomplishments in aviation inspired a generation of women aviators, including over a thousand women pilots of WASP, or Women Air Force Service Pilots, who flew in World War II. Although her death is a mystery, her life and achievements are inspirational. Thanks for listening. Next time I'll be talking about the Tuskegee syphilis study and the horrific torture done on 600 men. Until then, this was the good, the bad, and the pure evil.